Live from Atlanta, I'm Emilio Madrigal. This afternoon, we are delighted to host a cytopath talk with none other than Dr. Zubair Baloch, who, as many of you already know, is a professor of pathology at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Dr. Baloch will present his talk titled, Algorithmic Approach to Thyroid FNA. And as always, you're more than welcome to ask questions by typing them as comments right here in the Facebook Live and YouTube watch windows and I'll make sure to pass those questions along at the end of the session. So with that, I'll turn the microphone over to Dr. Baloch. Okay, thank you, Emilio. Um, it is really a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, and I don't know how many of you are there because um, the Eastern time is 4.30, and if you're from somewhere else um, far ahead and are you know, going to work or have finished work, then I apologize for this. So we'll make this as um, painless as possible. Um, so most of this is going to be a review, and that review is for the trainees as well as the practicing pathologist, especially for those who are working every day. So I think it, there are a lot of things that we should be reminded of and remember. So, so I'm gonna um, kind of start with, uh, These will be my discussion points where I'm going to handle, uh, talk a little bit about thyroid nodules, then the general considerations, and we're going to dive in a little bit into thyroid cytology, and I'll give you my perspectives on it. I think it's very important to know about the current status of the thyroid FNA classification, and we're going to still kind of talk as we go through possible controversies, and that's where my personal opinions will come on. And I do apologize if you, some of you don't agree with it or find it uncomfortable, but we can make it work. So thyroid nodules are common. And on the right hand of my screen is a painting, medieval painting, and it, you can see that even in that beautiful um, uh, depiction of a um, a lady and their servant, you can really see the, the goiter. So this, you can find the thyroid nodules like as far as you have the art available in the past. Um, but in US, even with all the iodine supplementation, we can find palpable nodules in up to 7% of people who are walking on the street. Um, and if you place an ultrasound probe on one of those necks, you was, that number is going to go dramatically up to 60%. So by six, up to 60% of US population has one or more thyroid no nodules. They are more common in women, and the good news is that 95% of them are benign. Now, what are the stats? Uh, when you look at the pathology of these nodules, as I pointed out, up to 95% are benign and only 5 to 10% are malignant. And this is what really kind of is the uh, is the meat of all the tests we do to find these uh, tumors. Good news, again, majority of these are well differentiated and behave in a benign or indolent fashion. Now, I think what is uh, really good for pathologists to know is how these thyroid nodules are evaluated. Clinical history is very important. Uh, in the past, we always thought that the family history of thyroid cancer, especially uh, medullary cancer, was very important. But now we are recognizing that even the history of papillary carcinoma in the family is very important because you can trace uh, papillary carcinoma through generations. I think from a pathology point of view, it's also important to know what is the functional status of that thyroid, whether the person is hyperthyroid or hypothyroid, because it really plays into what you see on the slide. And that will be the meat of my discussion. It is also important to know if the patient has other nodules. Now, the old legend that the multinodular gland was always or mostly benign is not true, because if you can imagine that the 60% of the population has one or more thyroid nodules, these cancers, a majority of them, are going to arise in the background of multiple nodules. So that myth is actually debunked. Local symptoms are always important because anaplastic carcinoma grows very fast and it's basically in some cases does not even requires a biopsy or a FNA. Uh, 
So that when the patient walks into the clinician's office, and thankfully, if they are walking into an endocrinologist's office and not directly to a surgeon, the lab findings become very important. So this is actually the paradigm of how these uh, nodules are uh, biopsied. And you can see if the patient's functional status, that means the thyroid function tests are within normal limits, that means the patient is euthyroid, the nodule, any nodule will go under FNA. And also if the patient is hypothyroid, that means there is high TSH, the patient is given uh, on put on synthroid or thyroid replacement, but it still will go on FNA. The only um, caveat will be if the patient's TSH is low, that means the patient is hyperthyroid, making too much of a thyroid hormone, that will require a radionuclide scan. And that is because the to exclude the possibility of a hyperfunctioning nodule because the thyroid carcinomas are rarely hot or functioning. But the, uh, the looking at the scans and all the thyroid nodules, the majority of the benign nodules are also hyperfunctioning and cold. So a doing a radionuclide scan and all every single thyroid that comes to the clinic is not going to be cost effective and it's not going to give you more information, though majority of the cancers are going to be hypofunctioning or cold. So this is actually a good flow chart um, that is followed clinically by the clinicians before they do a biopsy of a thyroid nodule. And these similar charts are available actually from uh, American Thyroid Association or other endocrinology uh, websites. So you can look this up if you are interested. Now, what I think is also important that before we dive into cytology is to really look into what is the role of ultrasound in the evaluation and management of thyroid nodules become, because this is becoming very, very important. So I think even if you do not do ultrasound yourself, um, it is really good to know about a little bit about thyroid ultrasound, what it does, and what are the buzz uh, ultrasound words, which kind of differentiate between a low suspicion or a high suspicion thyroid nodules. So I think it's, it's, it's good to just do a quick review of the normal thyroid anatomy and how does it look on ultrasound? Because some of us who go on FNAs um, and do either rapid onsite evaluation for when the radiologist or endocrinologist or surgeons are biopsying these nodules to really have a little bit of a sense how thyroid looks on ultrasound. So this slide basically kind of superimposes on the thyroid anatomy cartoon on how this thyroid is going to look on ultrasound. You can see the isthmus, which is really, I always look at the tracheal rings, and then you can recognize the lymph nodes and other vital structures and muscles in the neck. So now these are the buzzwords. Um, echogenicity, calcifications, margins of the nodule, and vascularity. And I have put uh, asterisks in front of the uh, the denominators are the words that are often used for high suspicion. So hypochoic, microcalcifications, irregular nodule, high intranodular vascularity are associated with thyroid cancer, but these are not 100%, but these do raise the suspicion of a thyroid nodule from benign to, a, uh, to malignant on a scale. And we'll just come to that in a couple of slides. So this is the next slide, and based upon these ultrasound features, because ultrasound has become very sensitive as well as pretty specific, American Thyroid Association has issued this, which is easily available from their uh, website, and you can see they rate the nodules based upon the risk of malignancy and the suspicious features, and you can just go and look at it, and it really is good to take a review of this um, the, the slide, and you can find this actually easily available, as I said, from American Thyroid Association website. 
Similarly, um, the Radiology Society, uh, American College of Radiologists, have come up also with their um, uh, guidelines, and they have divided um, basically a numbering system on how the thyroid nodules go from benign to suspicions, and they are called TR1 to TR5. And this slide, which again is available from ACR websites, outlines um, how what is the suspicious features of these nodules. So you're going to hear this more and more if you are going on site or in if you look into patient's chart. Granted, some of us may not have access to this information. So based upon this, this is actually a, a recent paper which really outlines the TR1 nodules which appear to be more spongy form uh, nodules with more hypoechoic foci, but there is beautiful septation. So these are called as complex nodules as compared to something which is more high suspicions because of the presence of microcalcification, hypoechoic or irregular margins to the nodule. So I am not an ultrasound expert, but by looking at this, you can really uh, may get a sense how these nodules are divided into benign and suspicious. Now, let's look at our thyroid FNA classification. And I think it's very important to know a little bit about the classification, which most of us know, thank God, uh, and what is the really what it has done to the current status of thyroid cytology. We all know the Bethesda classification scheme, and this is from the first edition, which came about after the NIH consensus conference that happened in 2007. Now, the, the beauty about this classification is, and I think this really reflects the everyday thyroid cytology, because it really takes into account the gray zones of what we see on cytology, because nothing is just black and white as benign versus malignant. So based upon this classification, most of us have learned how to triage our specimens and how to interpret them. Based upon the colloid we see or the ba other background features, the, the cytology of the follicular cells, which to me is more important, and also how atypical those nuclei are. And the majority of the times that we describe atypia uh, as compared to what the atypical nucleus or the cancer nucleus looks in papillary carcinoma. So this is what we are talking about because naturally the most common carcinoma is the papillary carcinoma. And on the left-hand side of my screen, as you can see here, this is really a good example of a lot of colloid in the background, which is benign, to something which has papillary formations and good nuclear features of papillary carcinoma, including inclusion. So it is basically a sliding scale of different morphologies that the specimens are triaged on the basis of Bethesda classifications from benign to malignant. But I think it's very important to also understand what was the timing of this Bethesda classification. And I think this was the exact and the correct timing, uh, in my opinion, when the Bethesda classification came about and was published. Um, and I think, first of all, when the Bethesda classification came, we had a lot of uncertainty in the surgical pathology uh, diagnosis of the so-called encapsulated follicular variant because the diagnoses range from benign to malignant. So surgical pathology, which was considered or is considered as the gold standard for the cytology diagnosis, what really was not so gold because there was a lot of different opinions and there was a lot of different variability among the pathologists. At the same time, the endocrinologist and the clinicians or the surgeons were recognizing that the thyroid cancers can be really, especially papillary carcinomas, can be divided into low and high risk tumors. So they really do not need such an excessive therapy, which is the total thyroidectomy, radioactive iodine treatment, which is sometimes can be excessive for a tumor, which is going to follow a benign clinical course. At the same time, 
based upon all this data, different associations were coming up with their own guidelines. So re they really needed something from pathology, especially cytology, for thyroid FNAs. So they needed to match their management guidelines for what was being classified on thyroid FNAs. And at the same time, we really started to hear more and more about the molecular diagnosis or molecular profiling of thyroid tumors, which led to developing of the test to diagnose thyroid nodules, not just on their own, but to serve as an ancillary test to thyroid FNA. So I think this was the exact, it was the great timing for this Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology to, uh, to come about or come in a pain. Now, this is just um, a, a table to show you that the Bethesda classification is not the only classification. All the different countries have their own classification. What really matters that they are all tiered classifications. Most of their um, categories can be matched with the Bethesda classification. So what happened is that it kind of created a common language, international language, among folks who are diagnosing thyroid nodules or treating thyroid nodules, which was, I think, was a great accomplishment. Now, based upon Bethesda classification, as I mentioned, uh, the different guidelines also published according how these FNAs or how these diagnoses be managed. And this is actually a great paper that was published in 2016 in JCM. And it really shows that when you call something atypical, neoplastic, suspicious for malignancy or malignant, how these nodules are managed, and which I think was very important, uh, a proof to really show the effectiveness of this classification. Now, after the classification, um, naturally, every single category in Bethesda classification from benign to malignant was associated with a risk of malignancy, which was calculated based upon the literature. What we realized that when the articles started publishing and different authors published their experience, the, these risk of malignancies will not exactly the same as what was published in the first edition. However, I will point of view that we have to, when we think of risk of malignancy, it is not as black and white as we think. Because what we calculated on the first edition was based upon the comprehensive review of the literature available at that time. But once when we calculate the risk of malignancy, we do only calculate it on the basis of cases that undergo surgical excision. What we do not take in account is the patient demographics, what patients are going to which medical center, the thyroid nodule features, and interpretive biases, because there's still variation among cytopathologists, what they're going to call atypical versus benign versus neoplasm. So that actually affects the risk of malignancy calculations. So if we pace ourselves and kind of just take a breather and think about it, that the most of the studies that we are looking at to calculate the risk of malignancy are from tertiary referral centers with different malignancy rate because they may most likely are going to see these high risk nodules. And what is being classified as AUS plus, these could be also representative of high rate of downgraded or upgraded diagnosis based upon second opinion or even among colleagues because there's a lot of variability. And malignancy rate are going to be differing, which we have seen that the first time diagnosis to surgery versus repeat FNA with AUS plus to surgery. But you know this paradigm is going to change or has changed because of the molecular test. So I think in a sense, when we look at the risk of malignancy, we do overestimate it because we are not taking into account all the patients which have this FNA diagnosis, we are only calculating it 
based upon a subset that undergoes surgery. So we kind of have to a little bit think about how, what is the overall risk of malignancy, which may be a difficult concept to swallow, but I think it is very provocative and kind of gives us an insight about how to think about these numbers. Also, as we all know, now the encapsulated follicular pattern lesions have been redefined. Um, so we have a new kid on the block, which is NIFTP, or the non-invasive follicular tumor with peppery-like nuclei, which used to be in former encapsulated non-invasive follicular variant of PTC. So we actually, these follicular pattern lesions based upon nuclear features of PTC absent or present can be divided into these categories, which are on this slide. And I really do not need to explain each one of them. So naturally, when we take this gray zone or category or, or the diagnosis or a lesion, which is the encapsulated non-invasive follicular variant, which tends to be more, create a lot of controversy even among surgical pathologists, it is really easy to understand that the most of the categories of the Bethesda system that are going to be affected by that are going to be indeterminate categories, especially AUS plus, or follicular neoplasm, or suspicious for follicular neoplasm, and even suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma. Because we all knew at the time of the first edition of Bethesda system that the a good number of cases classified as follicular neoplasm or suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma are going to be these encapsulated follicular variant of papillary carcinoma, which really do not have such distinct nuclear features of PTC or hidden features. And this has been actually shown in the studies that the um, the percent of the cases which are going to be classified and their follow-up is NIFTP, and most of these are retrospective studies, are going to be the indeterminate categories, which is AUS plus, follicular neoplasm, or suspicious for malignancy. And naturally, the decrease in the malignancy rate is going to be in these categories, and the most highest will be in the suspicious for malignancy. So taking into all this in account, this is all incorporated in the second edition of Bethesda classification scheme. And I, I am sure most of you are aware of it and have the book and using this. And as you can see, the risk of malignancy kind of changed as well as the management. And the management now includes the molecular testing, which has actually become not a rarity, but more of a norm nowadays when we look and classify these thyroid nodules. And then there is a second table, which also recommends, based upon the uh, article by Dr. Crane, that how, what the recommendation should include. So the NIFTP is included in uh, the recommendation for follicular neoplasm, suspicious for malignancy, and even some cases of which are classified as malignant. So, so this is basically a backdrop for my talk, and I think this is where the fun now begins. Um, and I'm going to be really, I'm going to label this part of my talk as things to remember and be reminded of. Because to me, this is really something that I have to remind myself every day. Um, because maybe I'm getting old, or maybe I need to be really understand, keep that in, so there's a running flow chart in everybody's hand. And I think this, this is something that we should not give up and just kind of stick with it because this, this is important. So let's talk about basic thyroid cytology. And I can, I personally divide basic thyroid cytology based upon the architecture as well as the cellular features. And this has been really, beautifully published. Um, actually, one of my favorite papers is by Dr. Nair, um, who really published the architectural features of uh, different uh, thyroid lesions. And it's all in the books written by all the experts. So this is not something new. So I think what is, as I said, thyroid histology is the gold standards, even sometimes as apples and oranges. I think it's, it's good to really look at the thyroid histology and how it compares with what we see on cytology. 
So let's take a nodule and a uh, higher power of a nodule, which has basically a macrofollicular pat macrofollicular pattern nodule, excuse me, which is very common in goitrous nodules. And the needle, when goes in there, what it pulls is the colloid from these uh, follicles, which are filled with this watery colloid. And if you're making smears, you know this beautiful chicken wire appearance that we get. And then the macrophages, which will look also uh, really nice on the smears. And you can actually even see hemosiderin in those or lysosomal granules. And the follicular cells from these macro follicles usually give rise to beautiful monolayer sheets. Now, sometimes these larger follicles can have hyperplastic uh, foci within them. And most of these basically inside the follicles, and you can see a lot of follicular epithelium within these follicles. And again, these nodules, even though have some little bit more cells, will give rise to this beautiful background of chicken wire colloid. And these follicular proliferation will make this specimen a little bit more cellular. But it will stay as a monolayer sheet with a lot of specks of thyroglobulin, kind of have this flame cell quality to it. So it's still benign features. Now, some of the thyroid nodules can have really beautiful papillary formations, which tend to be these um, papillae, which are really fat. Um, they really do not have a lot of vascularity in them. They do have subfollicles in these papillae. And once these are, uh, the needle kind of hits one of these, what you may get is more cohesive groups. You get the sense of papillary formations. That edematous stroma really plays well, as you can see on this smear. And you can even, in some cases, see these beautiful subfollicles within the pap papillae, actually in the meat of the papillae. But the follicular cells is still stay round with very even chromatin pattern. And you can get the features really nicely picket fencing on the top, no nuclear overlapping and crowding, which we are really kind of seeing in the papillae from the papillary thyroid carcinoma. The next is microfollicles. Now, microfollicles we can actually see in hyperplastic or adenomatoid nodules intermixed with macrofollicles or you can see them in follicular neoplasms. And this is actually an example of a follicular adenoma, which is very tightly packed. And needles from these will give rise to more of a, a monotonous population of follicular cells with a lot of nuclear overlapping and crowding, but really no nuclear cytology of papillary carcinoma. And this is just a high power of showing there's one of those microfollicles which is filled with this kind of a thicker colloid. And on cytology, you can really make up these beautiful microfollicles which are either in a group or you can see them as a single. But notice the round nuclei and the even chromatin pattern, which really kind of correlates with what we see on um, histology. Oncocytic cells. Where do we see oncocytic cells? You can see them in uh, goiter, but more commonly you see them in chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. I call them the trouble cells of the thyroid because they can have really prominent pleomorphic looking nuclei, large nuclei, can have prominent nucleoli. But naturally, if you, this are commonly occurring in chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis, the aspirates will also show the lymphocytic component. How do they look on cytology? They do have a lot of ample cytoplasm, round nuclei, prominent nucleoli, and in some cases where the change is pretty prominent. You can actually even see beautiful, which almost reminds you of intracellular bridges or the spaces between these cells. They can be binucleated cells or they can have single nucleus. On um, pap Nicolai stained slides, this is actually a thin prep, which shows you this uh, oncocytic group, but notice the lymphocytes, which are kind of interpersed between the cells, giving rise to these tangles or like tangle type appearance because this is the extruded DNA. But notice also that some of the oncocytic cells may appear 
may have smaller nuclei. So this is still so can be very heterogeneous population. I think the oncocytic change is on a spectrum. You have some cells which have just this ample kind of eosinophilic cytoplasm, but they really do not look like those typical oncocytes which have more of a denser cytoplasm with a sharp membrane um, structures. This is just another view showing you different tangles. Oncocytic cells can be delicate. So if they are smeared very hard, you may end up with a lot of naked nuclei in the background. And you have to be careful not to interpret these as larger lymphocytes. And it still can be, you know, and then uh, so you really need to be careful when you are doing smearing. But in thin prep, they do hold together. So based upon all the features we see, a aspirate of a hyperplastic nodule give most of them will give rise to a very heterogeneous picture. You're going to see colloid, different um, of uh, macrophages, follicular cells. These follicular cells can be in a smaller groups, large flat sheets, which can have this tissue culture effect. And on the pap stain, you can see the, again those very small nuclei with even chromatin pattern and really no atypical nuclear cytology. It's really good um, to see that these granules in the follicular cells, which are actually lysosomal granules, you know, that's where all the iodine, uh, iodination of the of the um, uh, of the iodine happens of it uh, coupling and making the thyroid hormone. So you can actually see them as granules. So these are not hemosiderin; these are actually lysosomal granules, which were actually described very early in the literature. Now. When you change your preparations from conventional smears to thin prep, you are going to lose some of those background features, but they are still there. You just have to learn how to recognize them. The colloid may appear as this like crumpled tissue paper or cellophane. I, I don't know what it is, but it looks like this is structure which is very transparent. And you can see this again attached to the follicular cells in the background. But the morphology is still very much replicated. Even on thin prep, you just have to get a little bit used to in interpreting this. So I think that this is very important to understand. Papillary carcinoma, slam dunk cases will show beautiful features architecturally, especially the classic variant. You will see good papillary formations with vessels, and you will see really good nuclei with all nuclear features which are the major diagnostic features of papillary carcinoma. You can see beautiful grooves, elongated nuclei. Remember, most papillary carcinomas will have elongated nuclei, delicate intranuclear grooves. And sometimes these intranuclear grooves do not traverse the entire length of the nucleus. So that is actually, they tend to be more delicate and beautiful intranuclear inclusions. And in some cases, you can even actually see really gorgeous somoma bodies. So no problem. This is a papillary carcinoma, which is a classic variant with even somoma bodies in it. Now, when you change again from conventional smears to thin prep, some of these features will get a little bit muted, but there are other features which get highlighted. The fragments in thin prep from a papillary carcinoma tend to have this more of a jigsaw puzzle appearance you can still see the beautiful sharp nuclear membranes with some abnormalities, really small micronucleoli grooves. But the number of intranuclear inclusions may not be as much as compared to smear. So this is actually the same case. You can see in the smear so many intranuclear inclusions, but uh, I personally can only find one. But I will tell you the trick. Once you see one intranuclear inclusion in a thin prep, if you search harder, you're going to find more. So they are all there. You just have to get used to how you screen these cases. So now let's put it all together and see how these nodules um, really look on histology as well as the ultrasound. The benign nodules, which are the TR, R1 nodules, you only have that really good spongy form appearance. And the experienced radiologist will tell you, or endocrinologist, this is a benign nodule. And this appearance is because of this macro follicular kind of growth pattern 
interprets microfollicles, and you have the histocytology, which really matches with the histology as well as with what you see on ultrasound. Similarly, chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis give rise to this very heterogeneous appearance. So I think it's good to know in the ultrasound reports what was the appearance of this nodule, what was the background. If the background is listed as heterogeneous, that is most likely a uh, chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis case. Now, if the radiologist is not experienced, they may interpret this lot of vascularity in chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis as bad. And you can see on histology, this areas of hypoechogenicity is because of the cells, a lot of lymphocytes where the ultrasound waves are just passing through, and because these are really a lot, lot of vascularity to these lesions, that's why this heterogeneous appearance is there, and the Doppler really lights this up as Christmas tree. On histology, you have beautiful oncocytic follicular cells with tangles of lymphocytes, the lymphocytes are, are in the background as well as infiltrating among the follicular cells. So this is really a classic case of chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis or Hashimoto's. Papillary carcinoma has a very a good case of papillary carcinoma. I will show microcalcification. So this irregular borders where it's invading, hypoechoic, and this will be really high suspicion or TR5 lesion by the radiology standards. And as you can see, these gorgeous nuclear features of papillary carcinoma groups. So this all matches. And actually, the somomatous calcification give rise to those really, you can see this kind of really bright specks on the ultrasound. One word of caution, sometimes thick colloid can also look benign, uh, look give rise to these bright specks on ultrasound. But a experienced radiologist will know that this is a comet tail artifact, which really you do not need to remember, which is for more of a benign lesion than a malignant a nodule. A follicular neoplasm usually appears as a very solid lesion with this beautiful halo around it, which is because of the capsule and compressed vessels and parenchyma around it. This is a microfollicular. This was a follicular adenoma. It gave rise to these beautiful microfollicles, which can appear as very cohesive groups on the diffquakes as well as pap stain slides. Notice the thick colloid, the round nuclei with even chromatin pattern. So this is actually a very classic case, which will be classified as follicular neoplasm or suspicious for follicular neoplasm according to Bethesda classification scheme. Oncocytic nodules, um, which can be oncocytic adenomas, oncocytic hyperplastic nodules, or oncocytic or heart cell carcinomas. By the way, the new WHO classification has gone back. So we are again using the term heart hole. So I don't know how many times they're going to go back and forth, but I'm going to use both terms interchangeably. These nodules tend to be a little bit more hyperechoic or can be hypoechoic, but my radiology friends always tell me that oncocytic nodules tend to be more hyperechoic, and you can again see this beautiful halo around it. And this is actually the aspirate from this lesion, and as you can see, beautiful oncocytes with that very thick cytoplasm, sharp uh, cytoplasmic membranes, prominent nucleoli, which is beautifully evident on this pap stain slide. So this is slam dunk, a case of oncocytic uh, lesion or oncocytic neoplasm. Do notice that sometimes those features may not be that prominent on the thin prep. You may have this nuclei may get a little bit more muddled. Um, the chromatin may not be that crisp, and you may not be able to see prominent nucleoli. But in some cases of thin prep, I have seen beautiful prominent nucleoli and oncocytic features. So it depends upon the lesion and the preparation. Um, one of the features that can be seen in oncocytic neoplasm is transgressing blood vessels between the um, the oncocytic cells. And this is beautifully described by publications by Dr. Kamal Khurana, uh, and as well as Dr. Faquin and Dr. Pittman from Mass Journal. So if you're interested, read those because those are the classic studies and oncocytic tumors. Now, 
The other things um, after cytology that I think is very important to remember, and I'll kind of always remind myself, the nodules, which is measuring one centimeter or less. The problem is that most of the guidelines will tell you not to biopsy the nodules would measure one or 1 1.5 centimeters. But there is so variability in reading these ultrasounds that you are going to get someone who is going to say this nodule is suspicious and should be biopsied. Because if all of those suspicious or any of those suspicious features, echogenicity, so-called calcification, irregular borders are present, then that nodule is a game to be biopsied. What we need to remember is that most nodules, which are measuring one centimeter or less, if they are tumors, they are papillary thyroid carcinomas, or very rarely, medullary microcarcinomas. Follicular carcinomas measuring one centimeter or less is basically non-existent. There may be very few reports in the literature, as well as there are very rare cases of heart cell or oncocytic follicular carcinomas which measure one centimeter or less. So basically, in a good majority of the cases that you're dealing with is a benign nodule. So you should have this in, in, in mind before you say, yeah, there's a lot of microfollicles, let's call it follicular neoplasm, move to next case. So I think it's very important. One also remember that always keep in mind that intrathyroidal parathyroid lesions or the parathyroids, which are very kind of close or kind of partly embedded in the thyroid on ultrasound may look like thyroid nodules. An experienced radiologist will tell you that this looks maybe a parathyroid, and then you can take it from there and do different studies. So this is actually a case of an intrathyroidal parathyroid, which was read by one radiologist as um, suspicious because it was solid and vascular. Naturally, parathyroid are going to be vascular lesions. And they put a needle in it. And the next radiologist read it and said, this lo still looks like a parathyroid. So this is actually was one of my cases. And as you can see, very, a uh, monotonous population of the follicular cells with nuclear overlapping and crowding, still round nuclei. And some of these almost kind of arranged in pseudopapillary groups. Because these are vascular lesions, you can actually see vessels, transgressing vessels, as well as papillary formations in these lesions. So they can mimic follicular neoplasm. And the way to deal with them that if you are suspecting parathyroid lesion, it's good to get a portion of the aspirate, if you're present on site, to send it for PTH uh, analysis. Or if you happen to get the cell block, like in this case, you can do immunostaining for PTH. Now, PTH antibody can be a little finicky. So in those cases, you can do GATA3 chromogranin or TTF1 stain to really bring the diagnosis home. But I think this is where the correlation really matters, looking at the calcium levels, asking for PTH level, asking for another radiology read to see if this is not parathyroid. And I, I'll tell you, I do this more often for smaller nodules, especially if they're located ex extremes of thyroid lobe. That means either at the inferior or superior pole. Now, Random nuclear atypia and marked nuclear atypia, that means marked nuclear pleomorphism, is commonly seen in benign lesions of the thyroid. So it is not only the malignant lesions. Most malignant lesions can be easily diagnosed based upon either nuclear features or monotonous cell population, except anaplastic or poorly differentiated carcinomas, which are not that common. So if you think of benign conditions, which cause a lot of random nuclear atypia. It can be a long-standing goiter, treated Graves' disease, or chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. These can really have the most ominous-looking nuclei that I have seen. And if you have been on Twitter, you know there was a whole thing started by Sanjay about the most pleomorphic cells you have seen. And you can see there was some post from thyroid um, where there was a lot of nuclear atypia. So I think the history the thyroid function test, and the ultrasound features. Knowledge of these is very important before you call something a poorly differentiated malignant neoplasm. So this is actually one of my cases, which is a 45-year-old female. She had a thyroid FNA. 
I was not told how, if there's a nodule, this was an outside aspirate, you know, how, what are the thyroid function tests? And this just came to my bench. And as you can see, on DIFQUIC, these cells are enlarged. They do have that kind of fire flare appearance to it. And they tend, uh, they are looking very monotonous. But just notice on the right hand side, this random nuclear atypia in these cell groups. No nuclear cytology of PTC. So I call the clinician and ask, and this patient actually has history of Graves' disease, has been long-term methamazole therapy, no distinct thyroid nodules, and the follow-up on radionuclide scan, there was diffuse uptake, but no distinct nodules. So this was actually a somebody stuck a needle in this enlarged thyroid, which was still enlarged after methamazole, but it, this was Graves' disease. Another case, 43-year-old woman, with a history of breast carcinoma, and then she naturally had a PET uh, scan done, and the PET showed this poorly circumscribed vascular area in the right thyroid. So the PET was positive, they did an ultrasound, they found this vascular area. Now, papillary carcinomas are always PET positive, so is as benign oncocytic nodules, as well as chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. Now I'm showing you the one field and they're based upon which this case was called atypical, really atypical looking cells. But notice again, a lot of cytoplasm and those sharp spaces between their cells. And on the left side, you can notice some of the lymphocytes percolating through those cell groups. And on histology, because this patient has history of breast cancer, atypical FNA, ultrasound suspicious, this was nothing but a chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis with small pockets of oncocytic cells, which had the most ominous looking nuclei. So you can see these changes in oncocytic cells in Graves' disease, as well as in goiter, and also in chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis, which is common in US because we, I, I believe this is because of the iodized salt, but that's another discussion. This is another case. This patient actually has told me that I can tell her history, no problem. This was actually, a, she was an endo, she's an endocrinologist who has this long standing history of Hashimoto's, totally been on thyroid replacement for a long time. She puts an ultrasound on her neck and realizes her ultrasound looks very abnormal. So she goes for a FNA, no thyroid nodules. And this was read as consistent with papillary thyroid carcinoma. Notice the cells have really this remarkable, remarkable clearing. No, maybe a few groups, new inclusions, but notice the lymphocytes percolating a little bit of through these groups. But that looks very atypical. She had a total thyroidectomy and it was nothing but this diffuse chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis with a lot of nuclear atypia. So that nuclear clearing that you notice on surge path, which is sometimes deemed is because of the fixation, I really don't think so. I think this, that is a cytokine effect, which you can also see on the cytology FNAs. Now, the third thing to remember and be reminded of that all papillary formations in thyroid are not created equal. So papillary formation does not always mean papillary carcinoma. And I apologize if I'm repeating some stuff that you guys already know, but I think it's, it's good to remind yourself that the papillary formations can be seen in goiter, in Graves' disease or toxic nodules, as well as in papillary hyperplastic nodules, which are, used to be called as papillary adenomas by Dr. Vickery, who actually was in Boston. And these really can tend to be more common in younger girls, and some of these can be hyperfunctioning nodules. So, we have to learn actually that architecture is important. That means papillary formation as well as microfollicles. But what we have to also look at the lesional cell cytology. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it's, it's good to remind yourself of that. And this is actually a case of a uh, benign papillary formation, which was actually a papillary hyperplastic nodule. And as you can see, these can give rise to these pseudopapillae and the cells in these tend to, on the periphery, tend to be round, really nicely lined up 
with even chromatin pattern, that kind of edema disease trauma, and I showed you this before, in some cases, you can actually beautifully see the sub follicle formation in them. So, and there are really good papers uh, published in the literature on this entity. So just kind of remember that the papillary formations not always means it is atypical or bad. So this is just, what I described now, you can actually even see rare intranuclear groups. And by the way, you can see intranuclear groups even in cells from goiter. So this is not does not always mean. So when I see something like this, I always ask a couple of questions. Is this how this nodule looks on ultrasound? They usually look like a complex nodule. Is this patient's, what is the patient's TSH? Which is, which is very important to see. Now, the other thing is the samples we are getting we are really at the mercy of who is sampling thyroid nodules. That's why I think it's good for all, uh, pathologists to get proficient in doing ultrasound guided biopsy, because I think you know what you're biopsying, you know what you see, and you know what you're looking on the slide. So I'm gonna show you some example, which can give rise to spurious reading because of the sampling, as well as what we have to remember that the thyroid nodules can be very heterogeneous in their appearance and their composition as well as the cells. So depending upon how it is sampled, you can may, may not be representative of the entire lesion. So this is actually one of those lesions which could have created a lot of controversy in the past. This is well demarcated, not really thickly encapsulated. It's basically a follicular pattern lesion which has a lot of micro follicles in it. And on higher powers, you can see larger follicles or macro follicles filled with almost kind of a watery looking colloid. Then some minor or micro follicles with really atypical nuclei. And that case from expert to expert could have been diagnosed as adenoma to follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma, but thank God that struggle is almost over. But now, let's take a shot at it. If the needle goes into this larger follicle, it's going to give rise to a cells which are going to look benign as compared to these smaller follicles which are going to give rise to these atypical looking cells. So depending upon how these nodules are biopsied, you may get different pictures. So it is very important for it to tell your clinicians who are biopsying to really walk around these nodules and get the sample from each quadrant of these. Similar cases here, benign looking nodule with small papillary formations. If the needle goes in this, it's going to look benign, but if the needle goes in this papillary formation area, this may give rise to this atypical architecture, increases the chances of be this being called as AUS or FLOS. This is another case where the nodule was biopsied here, which is a large nodule, and you can see the needle here. Most of the nodule had benign appearing cells, except this one group, which had nuclear grooves. And upon relook, when this patient, you can see here, because this, the patient had multiple nodules, she underwent a total thyroidectomy. Now here you can see, that the nodule that was biopsied, which has a lot of hemorrhage in it, was actually a benign nodule. This is the nodule which was not biopsied. Even this area appears more suspicious. And this was actually a papillary carcinoma. And you can actually track the bleeding up to this nodule. And as you can see, the needle passing through did pick up few cells, which made us call this nodule atypical. So how who's reading the ultrasound? who's sampling the nodule really affects your interpretation. So know who is, if you can, know who is really biopsying this nodule. This is another case. Patient with a large thyroid nodule, which was biopsied, and as you can see, these cells really do not look bad. Maybe some microfollicles, but basically look kind of benign. Now, this patient also had a lymph node, which was biopsied, and that looks like papillary thyroid carcinoma. So what is wrong with this picture? So I recall back, they went in and looked at the ultrasound again, and you can see this small papillary microcarcinoma, which is sitting here, and you can see very irregular growth patterns, even microcalcification. So this was actually more of a suspicious nodule that was not biopsied, and the ultrasonographer went for the more larger nodule because to 
to them, that appear needs to be biopsied. But actually, that is the suspicious nodule which is giving rise to the MAD. So we really are at the mercy of who's biopsying our nodules. I know this is a very controversial issue for the next slide I'm going to talk about, but I think it's good to know the history of prior FNA, especially the timing of it. This is actually a case that I got actually in consultation in which these were the only cells on the slide and it was, it was called as um, atypical cells cannot exclude anaplastic carcinoma. This patient is 19 years of age. She was very apprehensive and she had this nodule biopsied multiple, multiple times. And she went from doctor to doctor getting these biopsies. Surgical uh, pathology shows, and I said, well, you know, how many times this nodule has been biopsied? Three days ago. But the patient was so apprehensive because of one report saying, cannot exclude anaplastic carcinoma, that you see this totally infarcted nodule and you can see the granulation tissue formation with really abnormal looking. We know granulation tissue can have a lot of endothelial cells, a lot of wrapped up mesenchymal cells, and they can look really funny on cytology. So having that history really helps you to kind of tone down your diagnosis because you may think that, you know, you, or you may think about that these could be reactive changes. And actually, I remember Paul Wakely did a um, cytology seminar once. I think it was in Atlanta, and he presented a case which really looked horrific, and that was because of the post-FNA changes that were seen on the uh, repeat FNA. So are we done yet? I'm just going to go very quickly. And this is, I think, we there's a struggle about how we always worry about because we think NIFT-P is a benign disease. And so we, should we be relearning how to diagnose these cases? And I'm kind of a, a, kind of a little against it. So a little neuronal warm-up. You know, this is actually a case of a 59-year-old with a 1.9 centimeter nodule, very atypical FNA. So let's think about it. And I'm just going to list these cases and show you the histology. The follow-up on that was NIFT-P because this was a follicular variant, which is now called as NIFT-P, non-invasive. And this, actually, you can see the beautiful nuclei here, which are reflected on cytology. Second case, this case had beautiful papillary formations. You see this here. So just think about this case. What will be your diagnosis? AUS plus, follicular neoplasm, suspicious for PTC or PTC, no good nuclear inclusions. This was a classic variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Next case, 49-year-old, 3.5 centimeter hypochoic thyroid nodule, hypervascular, no microcalcification. This is the aspirate, follicular pattern nodule, grooves, beautiful clearing. What will you call it? AUS plus, follicular neoplasm, suspicious for PTC or PTC. Follow-up, invasive follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Now, why did I show you this exercise? Because I think the diagnostic considerations or conundrums for the ones for us is, what is consistent with PTC? What are the minimal criteria? And I think the jury is a little bit out on that for a definitive diagnosis of PTC or suspicious for PTC. So I, I think this is a little bit of a struggle. And I think it's because are we afraid of NIFT-P as follow-up because we know it has been advertised as benign, which is actually not true. You know, just go back and look at the classic uh, features of classic papillary carcinoma. This slide shows you what I showed you before and what we used to call as suspicious for PTC cytology. When we do not have inclusions, we had microfollicular proliferations. These are uh, slides from different cases. And this, these were the cases that I am used to calling at suspicious for PTC when I lacking inclusions, but I have all the other features. Now, based upon this, and I think this is even good for trainees to understand, should we define cytologic criteria for indeterminate diagnosis so that the risk of malignancy, because we are so hooked up on that, remain unchanged? So, you know, th there was a presentation given by my good friend, Dr. Al Sheikh, two years ago at the 
technical of society meeting in ASCAP. And I think that was one of the best presentations that I have attended. And, you know, and I, I agree with him that should I, I always ask myself questions, should I rush to downgrade my criteria from malignant to suspicious for malignancy or suspicious of malignancy to AUS plus? The other question is that invasive FPTC versus non-invasive FPTC, which is the NIFTP now, in majority of the cases, even though the literature shows, shows that you can on cytology suggest these, some of us do not see thyroid FNAs every day. So it may be very hard to distinguish between these two lesions. Yes, we can say, let's call them follicular neoplasm, let's call them suspicious, let's call them AUS. But this really may not be that um, real for us. So, you know, I really think there is the, the cytologic criteria of invasive versus non-invasive FPTC um, versus the classic papillary carcinoma, you are going to see a lot of overlap. Um, so you, one must be aware of it before we really go to change it. So on the left-hand side, I have a case which has gorgeous papillary formations. On the right-hand side, I have another case which has these beautiful intranuclear inclusions. So if I have both cases, what I will call them? Should I be calling them all suspicious for PTC or just when I have too many inclusions, then I can call it PTC. So I think that is a struggle. I'm not saying anybody's wrong in suggesting that, but that is my, so I think, but what we have to be aware of that if we change our cytologic criteria, we may be, or uh, have been in the danger of raising our percentage of indeterminate cases. And, but what I think the good news is that the most endocrinologists are now looking at pretest probability based on clinical and radiologic features. They just do not take cytology in view. And NIFTP is not a benign, uh, it is a neoplasm. So why we should be changing our diagnostic criteria? So I pose that question to you. And what the endocrinologists now believe in, that a benign clinical course after surgery with a low serum thyroglobulin test and a negative neck ultrasound is the most important outcome and ultimately is more important than the pathologic nomenclature. So I think this is this is really a good a time to be because we have thyroid cytology, we have a pretest probability of a cancer based upon ultrasound, sur surgical pathology, and then the follow-up all combined to really personal, personal management of these thyroid nodules. So what is what I consider the evaluation of thyroid nodules in 2018, history, physical examination, ultrasound with risk of stratification, FNA cytology sample, how you stratify it, and then the molecular analysis really plays a role in really deciding how ultimately these things could should be managed. But do remember, molecular tests are expensive, but there are caveats to molecular cancers, which is the demographic risk factors, radiation therapy as a children, coming from the area where their radiation you know, exposure has been as a child, suspicious sonographic features, when all the features of suspicious are present, and if you call it suspicious for malignancy, you really do not need molecular testing for those nodules, larger nodules, and then if the thyroid surgery is needed for another reason. So really do not need to do a molecular test to decide what type of surgery because that patient may just need total thyroidectomy, which is which is pretty common. So this is my uh, way of looking at this. You have a clinical presentation plus ultrasound presentation, which creates a pretest probability of a thyroid nodule. Then a specimen comes to you, you triaged it based upon the tiered classification. If in US, I will uh, vote for Bethesda. And then there is a paradigm different molecular paradigms. I have only listed one, but there are many available. I'm not proposing one over another, but whatever you choose, I, I like this paradigm because it gives me more idea for what I am going to be dealing with on the risk assessment basis. And then the clinician decides what is the optimal management of that thyroid nodule. So this is my last slide. And I really um, want to thank Emilio for setting up this talk for me. And I think as a pathology community, 
we we really care so much about ourselves at the national and international level that I think it's it's the time for peace and time for all of us to come together, regardless of the race, religion, and what we are in our personal lives. Um, you know, I think this is a great community that we have. And thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Baloch, for that excellent, excellent uh, approach to thyroid nodules, which I know it's a struggle for for many practicing cytopathologists, and you know, I think this is going to be very, very useful for the international community of pathologists. There are there are a few questions that have popped up on on Facebook, so um, I'll just read a couple of them to you. Um, so this one's from Jasmine Essowi. I think I'm pronouncing mm -hmm. that correctly, and. Um, so uh, they ask, uh, what is the accepted uh, what is the accepted time to reaspirate after an insufficient sample or AUS uh, in order to avoid false results? Um, so good question. Um, we uh, we did a study um, at at HAP with Dr. Lavolsi, and I think some other people have done it also. Um, what I found that the four to six week was a good time when that granulation tissue kind of resolved, um, there was more fibrosis and those reactive looking cells were not there. Um, so for me, that is actually a best time to wait. And you know, when the uh, clinicians do schedule patient, it takes that much time anyway. So I think four to six weeks is the best time. Um, okay. But getting that history is also very important if it's happening earlier than that. Okay. Here's another question. Uh, do you accept any fine uh, FNA samples in uh, multinodular goiter without suspicious, like a suspicious nodule uh, in radiology? Is uh, dominant complex nodule without suspicious radiology criteria a prerequisite to aspirate? Yeah, so uh, remember, the, the, one of the guidelines do, do say that you have to establish um, the diagnosis on one of those nodules, and if it's benign, you leave it alone. But you do have to follow benign nodules because even the benign category is associated. It's not 100% benign. It is associated with a little bit of a malignancy risk in there, mm -hmm. which is also, again, operator dependent. So a, a good clinician will always when you have sonographically similar thyroid nodules, they will biopsy one of the largest nodules to set up a baseline. And if you give the benign diagnosis, they will just follow it. So yes, uh, aspiration of a nodule in a multinodular goiter to set up the baseline is okay, and that is acceptable. Okay. And what about cutoff for uh, features of nuclear features of PTC, you know, I mean, that, that's one of the questions that they're asking about here. You know, do you have any type of cutoff? Uh, how many so for, internuclear inclusions or grooves you'd want to see before you commit to, you know, suspicious or just outright? So for me, um, sadly, and I know there, there's a lot of people, a lot of experts will not agree with me, but to me, it's like, um, I believe in more of a multifocality of the, the features. Mm -hmm. So me, for me, if like a couple of slides are showing these group of cells, which have internuclear grooves elongated, nuclear chromatin clearing, and even if I have one inclusion, to me that is callable as a consistent with papillary thyroid carcinoma. I do not have a quantitative number to say, I need so many grooves, I need so many inclusions. I know there are studies done on it, but to me it's the multifocality of these that really matters. If you see only one group which has internuclear grooves, but no inclusions, that naturally I will push that more toward AUS. But if you have you have multiple slides or multiple groups on one slide of a thin prep that are showing these features, I will push them into suspicious. And if I see one nuclear inclusion, good intranuclear inclusion, that means the the new intranuclear inclusion looks like the background of the slide. It has mm -hmm. a really nice border. Right. To me, that is classable, callable as PTC. But you would at least want to see at least one intranuclear yes, inclusion? Yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I do. Yeah. So you would not call it if that one intranuclear no. pseudo inclusion? To me, to me, all the diagnostic nuclear, major diagnostic nuclear features need to be met, which are the nuclear features, mm -hmm. before I say a malignant. Okay. 
And what's your what's your take on just uh, labs that pr use liquid-based cytology primarily or only liquid-based cytology compared to uh, direct smears? I think direct smears um, are good. So we do both. So for me, the direct smears and thin prep are good. But to me, if you're not going on site and if you're relying on clinicians to do your uh, smears and this stuff, it's good to do all just nothing but the thin prep and i think it's i i used to be oh my god oh my god because i was trained by dr gupta and he was he was not that fond of thin preps mm -hmm. for or monolayer preps for non gyns but then you know you, you learn and i think right. um um if you if you just do thin prep you just have to get used to it it's totally fine there is no problem okay. i'd rather have one good thin prep than have 20 smears which are horrible <laughs> and i cannot see through slides right so and just one last thing, as for cell blocks, do you prepare cell blocks on all of your? On all of so your... I do not, no, we don't, because we prefer more to go on the thin prep. But I, in cases like if we are thinking of medullary carcinoma and this stuff, and we have started preparing these, I'm not, I do not have uh, any money involved in the thin prep group, but we have started preparing cell and cell blocks. And those are really good to do some immunos, especially for parathyroid, met for medullary carcinoma cases and stuff like that. So, you know, um, in those, but no, regularly we do not prepare cell blocks. Okay, so it's not routine for you to do no, it on all, all of your, on yeah. all of your Because cases. I think you have to be a little bit careful about when you are really totally relying on cell blocks because the way the cell blocks are prepared, they may have their own artifacts that you have to get used to. Right. I still remember a case of somebody called papillary carcinoma because every single cell on that cell block had a neutral intranuclear inclusion, which was, I believe, was a fixation artifact. Mm -hmm. So you have to get used to it. So, um, but we do, but on on need basis, not regularly. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. So as far as I see, I don't see any other. I don't see any other questions right now, but, you know, again, thank you very much for this, thank you. this awesome lecture. And so I just want to remind our audience that today's lecture, like as always, can be found at pathologycast.com. And we hope you enjoyed today's session. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you so much.